Okay. All right. All right. Welcome everyone to our master class on a functional medicine approach to weight loss. I'm Gloria Treister. I work with Dr. Gutierrez. We collaborate to bring you educational programs that help you become empowered to be in charge of your own health and well being. We've been so conditioned over the years to think that the doctor tells you what to do and then you do that without realizing that you really can listen to what your body's telling you and act on that rather than using an allopathic medicine approach, which helps us in a lot of ways. And what that means is allopathic medicine means that you treat with drugs and surgery. Functional medicine has a different approach. So in an allopathic approach, you have a symptom, you go to the doctor, the doctor says, oh, that's an interesting symptom. Here's a drug, let's squash that symptom. Whereas a functional medicine approach will say, you have a symptom. Hmm. Where's it coming from? Why do you have that symptom? Is it something that happened recently or is it related to something that might've happened when you were a child? So it's a whole different way of looking at your health. It's more holistic in nature. And so we love that approach. Um, Dr. Gutierrez is trained in functional medicine. I've been privileged to work with a lot of wonderful functional medicine doctors and naturopathic doctors who look at health from that perspective. And that's something that we really honor. And we want to bring it to everyone. It's not that accessible right now. Functional medicine is an out-of-pocket expense for the most part because you can't do functional medicine at a 10-minute doctor visit. It doesn't work. They need to know more about you. And so it becomes a little bit more expensive and out of pocket for some people. So one of our goals in establishing our Get Well With Us courses is to bring functional medicine to everybody. This is what we want. We want to empower you with the knowledge that you need to have a really healthy, well life. So um, for me, I started in healthcare over 35 years ago. Um, I owned a physical therapy company for 17 years. In 1997, I sold it to a publicly traded company and I worked for them for six years. And all the while I kept thinking, why do you need to be broken in order to fix you? Why is it the way that we handle our healthcare in this country that you go along and then all of a sudden one day you're not well and then you try to fix it? I often wondered, why aren't we trying to prevent disease? And I don't know why those thoughts came to me, but they did. And so after working for the acquiring company, I decided to start Wellness Evolution and started on that journey towards helping people achieve better health and well-being. Um, it's been an exciting journey. Along the way, I met Dr. Gutierrez, who is just a fabulous, one of the smartest and kindest doctors I've ever known and um, just love working together. And we're so honored to have you here and to be able to share this perspective with you. I don't know how many of you have struggled with weight. I never did until the last five years or so. So I've learned a lot about what else might be playing a role in my inability to lose weight. I can't eat any less. I, I already eat healthy. So what else might be going on? And that's what we want to bring to you today. So um, Tammy, I'd love for you to introduce yourself and take it away. Absolutely. So I am Tammy Gutierrez. I actually have an MD from Case. I grew up in Ohio and uh, did my medical training here and just wanted to help people. But I definitely noticed as a family doctor that I just spent a lot of time chasing those symptoms around, right? And it just seemed like people kept getting worse and worse over time instead of better, right? And the idea of just adding more and more drugs to them didn't really resonate. And then I had my own personal health experience um, in my 30s, early 30s with a four-year-old at home. I was diagnosed with a really rare type of vascular cancer and I was stunned, right? I didn't drink, I didn't smoke, I ate pretty healthy, I was active. It's like, why, why did I get cancer? I'm, you know, I'm supposed to be the healthy person. And um, what I came to realize, right, is that your body 
uses these signals to tell you that something isn't okay, that there's something you're missing uh, or you need to change. And so I was under a ton of stress um, and I wasn't getting enough sleep. And so my immune system couldn't do what it needed to do to keep me safe. And so I got this bizarre, super crazy rare cancer process and really learned a ton. It didn't have any Western medical answers. There was no real allopathic solution except to cut it off and cross your fingers that you weren't in the one out of three people that would be dead in five years. And again, that was not a satisfying solution. So I went looking for other answers, right? And what I found initially was nutrition. And then over time, I found functional medicine because I was stunned when I changed my diet, even though I was eating pretty well to start with, when I really changed my diet intensely, I discovered that not only did I fight off my cancer successfully, but I, I fixed my seasonal allergies for the most part. And I just felt so much better. I had more energy. I just felt wonderful. And so I was like, wait a minute, why aren't we doing this? Right. I actually fully understood for the first time what it meant to really feel well right? Not to just not be sick, but to truly feel fully and optimally well. And so I embraced that and kept pursuing it and started using it with my patients and then found functional medicine training and deepened my understanding and went through a couple more personal journeys <laughs> um, with a child with lots of food sensitivities and a bunch of other things that really honed my understanding and my knowledge. And so now this is what I do right? I really, I don't want to just medicate people. I want to help them feel well. I want them to find the solutions to the way they are supposed to be and to listen to their body and truly take that information to heart. Um, because your body isn't giving you symptoms uh, just to annoy you, right? Like it's like little lights on your dashboard. They are warning you that there's something that needs your attention. And so I want you and your body to communicate clearly and effectively so that you can feel awesome all the time. Um, and so we are doing this particular program because there's only one of me and I am struggling to keep up with the demand. There's just a lot of people who need care and we just can't reach them one-on-one. -on -one. And so we're trying to find ways to create hubs of information that people can access and use because again i don't heal anybody except me right each of us is really the ultimate person that's responsible for healing i am a reference librarian offering you the tools and the skills so that you can do the work of healing and grow your own beautiful garden um, and so that's what we're going to talk about today one of the things <clears throat> that i feel really um, became apparent during these last couple of years of the pandemic is that there are so many different factors that go into weight. And so many people struggled with weight even before the pandemic, but I feel like the pandemic has made that worse for so, so many more people. And I think you'll understand why when we talk about this, but the goal of today is a paradigm shift. We have been raised in this country to think about weight as an arithmetic problem, right? Calories in minus calories out equals what you're gonna weigh at the end of the day. And the reality is that is just not true. Right? It's just not true. There are so many different complex layers. Your body is so amazing and complex and beautiful. You are an entire ecosystem. And so, you know, nothing, nothing in your health is actually that simplistic, but there are a couple problems with the fact that everybody thinks it is. One is that then they feel guilty, right? Like there's something wrong with you or you have no willpower if you can't just you know, cut back your calories and then lose the weight you want. And so many people feel not just frustrated that they can't lose the weight, but very judged, right? Um, and that some of that judgment's coming from outside, but a lot of it's coming from inside, right? That's coming from people feeling like, oh, I must be doing this wrong right? There must be something wrong with me that I can't just achieve this goal that I want to see. And so I want a paradigm shift for everybody here today. If you are struggling with weight, it's because your body thinks that it has a good reason to hold on to those calories. Okay. I'm going to say that again, because this is the critical point I want you all to understand about weight. If you are struggling to lose weight, it is because your body thinks that it needs to hold on to those calories, right? And I'm gonna use 
an example from the pandemic that we all experienced back at the beginning of the pandemic in early 2020 um, to kind of illustrate this in a much simpler way. So you'll probably all remember that in spring 2020, there were shortages of a variety of things, one of which was toilet paper. Right, And I think most of us consider toilet paper to be a basic necessity, and we really don't want to live without it. And so this provoked a lot of panic and a lot of consternation um, in people. And some people responded to that by really getting pretty stingy with their toilet paper and cutting back. But most people tried to just buy it whenever they saw it and to maybe have a little extra in the house so that they knew that if it wasn't there next week, when they went to the store, that then they would have some tucked away. But some people really felt a lot of insecurity here, right? And I will tell you, my husband is one of those people. And so we were responsible for providing toilet paper for our family and my parents at times, and my sister and her family of five in Boston, where toilet paper was much harder to find. And so he was the designated shopper, and he just kind of got in the habit of taking any extra toilet paper, you know, that he was allowed to buy and stashing it away. And so we essentially became overweight <laughs> with toilet paper in this house. And we had toilet paper tucked away in all kinds of places that maybe it doesn't normally belong, right? Just like little fat cells. And so even after the shortage disappeared, he still had a tendency to buy new when we were running low in the bathroom instead of going and getting it out of the closet or out of the garage or out of the laundry room or out of the basement or wherever it was that it was hiding. And so our house ended up becoming this bizarre depository of toilet paper. And so it was really hard for him to sort of not feel that scarcity right? He kind of felt this threat. He was responsible for like 15 people being able to wipe their bum. And so he didn't want to fail in that job. Your body is responsible for keeping you alive. And for most of human history, food scarcity was a bigger threat than obesity, right? Weight gain was not really a threat <laughs> to your survival. Weight loss and inability to feed yourself was, and especially in times of stress. So when there's a threat to your body, it does that same kind of, okay, well, I'm going to just take whatever extra I can find and I'm going to tuck it away. I'm going to put it in my belly. I'm going to put it in my arms. I'm going to put it in my thighs. I'm going to keep it because if I'm under some kind of threat or stress, I might starve to death if I'm not careful. And so weight gain has this anti-starvation mechanism behind it almost always. Something is triggering the body to think that it is under attack in some way. And so it better stock up so that you don't starve, right? It wants to keep you alive and well. The problem is in modern society, that's not usually the case. Right? When we are under attack or stress, we are not usually in a place of calorie deprivation the way we would have been after an earthquake or during a famine or during a war or during a hurricane. Right, That natural disaster response is not really appropriate now because starvation is unlikely, not impossible. Right, like If you looked at the population in Haiti after the last earthquake there, they were getting by on five to 800 calories a day. Okay, these weight gain mechanisms were designed and effective in keeping these people from starving to death. But the reality is in Chardon, Ohio, I am unlikely to have that degree of calorie restriction. And so that anti-starvation reflexive mechanism is no longer serving me very well. And when I'm under stress or under attack or sick in some way, I would prefer not to pack on the extra calories, right? Just, just like I would prefer not to have toilet paper in my laundry room closet when I open it up. Um, and so I want to help you guys start figuring out how to turn off the threat. Because if you turn off the threat, then the body will stop hoarding. It will take a little while to shift. But what we really want is to get out of that anti-starvation paradigm. Okay. If anyone has questions or this doesn't make sense, put it in the chat, but I'm gonna kind of talk about all of the, the main ways that the body feels under threat 
right? And so if we can address the ways in which your body feels under threat, then you can resolve the problem and your body can stop hoarding those calories that you don't want. And then it can enable you to go ahead and lose the weight with healthy lifestyle. All right. So I consider them there to be about six main categories. And in functional medicine, one of the rules is when in doubt, you start with the gut. So we're, we're going to start with the two that kind of live in the gut. One of which is your microbiome. And I mentioned earlier, right, that you are an ecosystem. You are home, if you are healthy, to more bacteria than there are people on the planet right now. Okay, you are supposed to have approximately a trillion good guys inside your gut mostly, but also in your lungs, on your skin, in your vaginal canal, lots of different places, right? You are an amazingly complex community. And that's not one group of bacteria, right? It's not a trillion of one bacteria. It's hundreds of different bacteria creating a functional and healthy and vibrant community. These bacteria act as first line defenders right? To help bad guys not have a place to land. They also help talk to the immune system and regulate allergies and sensitivities. They talk to our brain. There are more communications between our brain and our gut on a daily basis than there are between our brain and the entire rest of our body. So your gut and your brain are essentially one organ, right? And so this microbiome health has a lot to do with your mood, has a lot to do with your energy, and it has a lot to do with your weight. They have shown in studies in rodents, um, they took these mice and they genetically altered them to become obese so that they could study diabetes. But then somebody had this brilliant idea to look at the microbiome, right? And so in theory, these mice gained weight, not because of their microbiome, but because of their genetic alteration, right? But then they took the microbiome, they wiped out the, the gut, bacteria in a healthy mouse, and they took the gut bacteria from the obese, genetically altered mouse, and they put it into the gut of the healthy mouse, and the healthy mouse got fat. And then they tried it in reverse. They wiped out the bacteria in the gut of the obese mouse, and they took the bacteria from a healthy weight mouse, and they put that into the obese mouse's gut, and it lost weight. So even above and beyond the genetic alteration that was designed to cause weight gain, the microbiome actually trumped it and changed that set point. And this was huge, right? This data rocked you know, the world that was paying attention to this because that really means that your microbiome is, is possibly the most important part of establishing that set point. And we have so many things that are attacking our microbiome these days, right? How many of you haven't had an antibiotic? How many of you don't eat food that's full of pesticide and herbicide. You know, Roundup is everywhere. It's in the rain. They did a study in California and showed that no matter what you eat, every single person in the thousand people they checked had Roundup in their pee on the day of the study. And they didn't drink Roundup before the study. They just ate food. People who ate an organic diet had less Roundup in their pee, but everybody had Roundup in their pee at least a little, because it is everywhere. It is in our water. It is in our dirt. It is everywhere. And Roundup was originally designed as an antibiotic. And so all that Roundup makes your microbiome struggle. And so there's so many different insults on your healthy microbiome. People don't eat fermented foods anymore, right? This used to be a standard part of nutrition and what people ate because they didn't have refrigerators. And so now we eat far less good guys going in and we wash our hands and we keep everything clean and we don't eat dirt, preferably without as much Roundup in it, but you know, we have all these things. And so the microbiome is not healthy. And then that causes a shift in our weight gain, right? And our body feels under attack. So it goes into anti-starvation mode again. The other big thing that happens with all that gut disruption is you start getting holes in the lining, right? And not just antibiotics, but steroids, and high stress levels. So many things poke holes in the lining. And then when you poke holes in the lining, some of your food doesn't get fully digested and those undigested proteins get in and they cause food sensitivities. 
And so your immune system is checking everybody's passport, making sure that everything is fully broken down and safe to come in and that it's not an invader. And when it sees a giant protein that's not supposed to be on the list, then it assumes it's a virus and your antiviral defense system kicks in. And now all of a sudden you have wanted posters for gluten or dairy or corn, right? And then every time you eat those, your body feels under attack. So of course, it mounts your anti-starvation response system. So nearly everybody with food sensitivities ends up gaining weight as part of the process, right? And when people are coming into me with almost any kind of inflammation, your immune system mostly lives in your gut. And so most inflammation is gut related. And so one of the first things we do is we try to figure out what those triggers might be and remove them. Because if you can stop making the immune system feel under attack, then you can stop triggering that waking response. And a lot of people just lose weight when they change their diet without like, any other calorie restriction or other things. So those are the two big gut factors. But I also want to talk about sort of that stress response that I mentioned is so good at poking holes in the gut, and causing those food sensitivities. And so your adrenal glands are really kind of the master part of your stress response. They are in charge of that anti-starvation response system. And they sit on top of your kidneys and they make adrenaline, right? And they make cortisol. And so both of those hormones are life-saving. We need them. They're super important. But the reality is when we are under any kind of stress, emotional, physical, mental, whatever, then we put out a fight or flight response. And so the adrenaline goes up and then the cortisol chases it. And adrenaline makes us mobilize calories and burn things, but it's designed to be a few minutes long, right? The tiger is chasing you. You're going to run or you're going to fight. And then you're either going to win and you can settle back down or you're going to get eaten, in which case it's irrelevant and it's no big deal. And so you don't need that response anymore. But in modern America, that's not what we do, right? We have constant stress coming in all kinds of directions. We take very little break from it. And so there's much more cortisol that's chasing that acute response that's trying to turn off some of the harm that comes from nonstop adrenaline all the time. And so it's trying to actually cause weight storage. It's trying to turn down how fast you're using your calories. It's trying to promote um, hunker down and hang in for the long haul because it assumes that you are under long-term attack from war or famine or natural disaster. That is what your body assumes when you are flooded with cortisol all the time. It pokes holes in the gut. It removes maintenance and repair, right? If your house is on fire, you're not going to vacuum the rug or clean out the gutters. You're not worried about maintenance. You're worried about survival. And so you stop doing all these other things and then you trash your microbiome, you develop food sensitivities, you also are already storing fat, you change your ability to detox, we're going to talk about toxins in a second as another factor here, right, you're not, again, you're not doing cleanup you're doing survival. And so you mess with your other hormones. Cortisol is your master hormone and it disrupts when it is high for a long period of time. It disrupts your thyroid. It disrupts your female hormones. It disrupts your androgens. It disrupts your growth hormone and all of the other things that impact your metabolism. And so the downstream effects get magnified. And the other hormone that high cortisol really messes with is insulin. And so insulin resistance gets to be number four on our list today. It is so widespread. Even just gaining weight causes insulin resistance, but gaining weight and having high cortisol is like an insulin buffet. Insulin is the hormone your pancreas makes when you eat carbohydrates or sugars, um, because as your blood sugar goes up, the insulin goes up with it in order to help you put it away because most of your body can't put away glucose without something to unlock the door, right? You have to unlock the pantry so that you can stick the sugar molecules into your muscles and your other organs. And so if you don't have enough insulin to open up those little doors, then you can't get the sugar in the muscles. So your body carefully monitors. And when your sugar goes up, it puts out insulin so you can put it away right? That's how it's supposed to work. But over time, being exposed to higher and higher doses of insulin or all the time insulin with no real break, the muscles and, and the receptors for that insulin basically get gummed up, 
right? Which is called insulin resistance. I often describe it to people as, because <laughs> I have a teenager, as having a teenager upstairs playing loud music, right? And so you yell from downstairs, like, hey, turn the music down. And they don't want to hear you yelling. So they turn the music up. <laughs> and so then you yell louder and then the music goes louder and then you yell louder. And then eventually somebody can't, go any louder, right? And that's when somebody gets diabetes, which is what most people think of when they're thinking about insulin. But diabetes in that description is end stage, right? The insulin resistance has been there for years in this ever increasing fight to go louder and louder to try to put the sugar away. And that insulin resistance is a storage hormone. Insulin is a put away hormone. When insulin is high, you cannot take calories out right? And so people who are chronically insulin resistant, who have chronically elevated levels of, of insulin in their blood, they cannot lose weight. You have to lower the insulin first in order to be able to get the fat calories out of storage. And so that is a huge problem. And it causes, again, not just diabetes at the end of its trajectory, but it causes most of the other things we think of as all of the heart disease issues. It causes the high cholesterol, it causes hypertension or high blood pressure. It causes high cholesterol. It causes heart disease and strokes. It causes kidney disease. It causes vascular inflammation, but it also causes uh, ovarian dysfunction, people with polycystic ovarian syndrome and irregular periods, that's insulin resistance, right? It causes rashes um, called acanthosis nigricans. It causes lots of things. And so people often have markers of insulin resistance and they don't even realize that that's what's going on in their system. All right. <laughs> so those are the first four. I want to talk about toxins a tiny bit as well. So we are not only bombarded by Roundup, but we are bombarded by heavy metals, right? In our cosmetics, I don't know if you're aware of this, but uh, more than half of the lipsticks on the, on the market right now actually have heavy metals like lead in them, right? <laughs> and you can't really put on lipstick without ingesting it. Um, I have definitely had patients who've had tin toxicity. Um, I've had people with other heavy metal toxicity, mercury from your fillings. I've had people who have struggles with the arsenic, right? Rice has become a staple in our diet and almost all rice naturally pulls arsenic from the soil, where it is both a naturally occurring element and also a common ingredient in many herbicides and pesticides. So almost all rice grown in the Southeast US is crazy high in arsenic because they put arsenic on the cotton fields. And so there's tons of arsenic in the soil down there that we added on top of the naturally occurring stuff and rice naturally pulls it in. And so if you're eating a lot of rice-based foods, you are eating a lot of arsenic, right? This is why we've stopped recommending rice cereal as baby's first food because they checked the levels in the baby food and it was crazy high in arsenic. And so we are constantly facing a bunch of toxins, right? And so when you take in those toxins, of course, your body feels poisoned. It feels under attack. And if you put in enough of them, or if you go through a stressful period or something else that slows down your ability to clean them out, then you activate that anti-starvation um, defense mechanism, right? And so it can be another part that is triggering weight issues. And it's a tricky one because we often store those metals and toxins in our fat cells. And so if you start losing weight, sometimes you are actually flooding your system, right? You're releasing those toxins back into your bloodstream. And so sometimes people say, well, I lost a few pounds, but then it's just like it stopped. Sometimes that's a clue, right? That actually you had stored toxins in your fat cells, you mobilize them, your body said, holy crap, we're being poisoned. And it put the brakes on because it assumed you were unsafe and it went into the anti-starvation mode. And so toxins are another one that we often need to support to really mobilize um, all those fat cells that you would like to get rid of. And then the last one is other hormones. I actually put them last in part because they are almost always secondary to the other things I've just mentioned. And also because these are things that you may actually have to get some help with in order to figure out. So things like a thyroid disorder, right? If your thyroid is not functioning well and you're not making enough thyroid hormone, then your metabolism goes down and you absolutely will gain weight for most people. Um, female hormones, right? Sometimes people notice that pregnancy was their trigger for weight gain or changing their birth control was their trigger for weight gain or menopause was their trigger for weight gain, 
right? And so the balance of your female hormones is also another thing that really affects your set point and your metabolism. And so for some women, especially, and some men, right? There's andropause as well. Um, not having enough sex hormone levels can really be a big player in monitoring this. Again, I put it last though, because it is nearly always secondary, right? If your adrenals are healthy and your gut is healthy and you are not toxic, odds are good that your other hormones are going to be more stable, right? So almost everyone who comes to me with thyroid disease or female hormone imbalance issues, you know, part of fixing them is fixing the underlying triggers that I've just mentioned in those other five. So I know that was a whole lot of information <laughs> and we're going to pause and let people ask questions and talk about some of this a little more, but I hope at a minimum, you are at least seeing why the calories that you put on your plate for any given meal are really not your biggest issue, right? Even if you cut them back, to 600 calories a day, if your body thinks you're starving to death, it's going to fight you tooth and nail. And it's going to hold on to as many of those calories as it can. It's going to slow your metabolism to a grinding halt. And you're not going to lose the weight and you're going to feel crappy and deprived the whole time, right? Because when you starve yourself, you tell your anti-starvation mechanisms that they are needed and that they should stay right? You can't turn off an anti-starvation problem by starving yourself, right? It's never going to work. You might get a few weeks and then it's going to backfire. And so we really want to help you move in a different direction. All right. Gloria, have there been questions? I have not been watching the chat while I was talking. No, but Liz loved the uh, hoarding analogy about oh. toilet paper, <laughs> which was yeah. great. Um, yeah, any questions? You want to put them in the chat box? That would be great. Or just raise your hand. You can do that. Um, okay, okay, Jennifer. Jennifer has a question. Hi, I actually have two. Um, yeah. I know, Dr. G, you're big on the microbiome. And I know you said to eat sauerkraut, but are like um, boar's head pickles a good yeah. substitute? Like the natural um, pickles? Are they refrigerated? Yes. Yeah, in gen, and do they say on the bottle that they have live cultures or that that they might be bubbly? Do they say I, that? I don't know. I had them on vacation. They were like the best pickles in the world. They have to be refrigerated. You could see like the carrots and stuff like in the bottom of the jar. Okay. Um, so I would say um check and see what happens if you have the lid on for a while. Like, do you get any kind of fizz or bubbles at all? And does it have that kind of slight sourness to it, right? Does it have that extra, almost like drinking a Verner's, right? That there's almost like this little extra something in there that almost stings a little bit. Um, no. Okay. You could call the company. There are fermented pickles on the market. Usually they do put some little warning on the jar to say like, Hey, if you see bubbles in it, it doesn't mean we've gone bad, right? The bacteria are supposed to be in the jar. And so it's okay to have that gas production, but there are some companies like I know Vlasic makes a pickle that has to be refrigerated, but it's not fermented. And so you would just have to see, I know that locally, um, I'm sorry, Wake, Rob, Wake Robin makes fermented pickles. Um, Heinen sells Wake Robin next to the salad bar, but um, I know that Wake Robin makes fermented pickles, and I feel like there's at least another one or two brands of fermented pickles um, because they are yummy. And Cleveland Kraut makes a pickle-ish kraut, like they have one called Cabbage and Cukes that tastes like dill pickles, and they also have one called Whiskey Dill that tastes kind of like dill pickles. Um, the cabbage and cukes is actually mostly cucumbers. Um, the whiskey dill is mostly cabbage and carrots, um, like a traditional sauerkraut, but they both have a pickle flavor profile. Um, and so both of those are pickle-like options. Um, but if you found a pickle that's really yummy, call them. And if they're fermented, let me know, because I love being able to recommend wonderful, delicious fermented things for people. And you said Wake Robin, that's at Heinen's? Wake Robin is at Heinen's. Wake Robin comes in glass jars and um, they have a spicy pickle that's like a garlic dill and they have a non-spicy pickle that I want to say are called dill spears. I don't know. We eat so many pickles in this house. <laughs> so that would be good to eat every day, right? 
Yes. So in an ideal world, we would all eat a spoonful or two of fermented something at least once, if not twice a day, right? Like I mentioned, we are constantly killing off good guys and we have to stop, you know, we have to put them back and minimize the amount of killing we do. But the more you can put good guys in and the more diverse sources of good guys you have, um, the better it will be. Anybody that gardens right now, because it's such a beautiful time of year here right now and things are growing. If you have clean soil and you don't put any chemicals on it, you know, I'm all about pick that produce and just eat it. Don't wash your hands, right? That's a great way to also get soil-based bacteria. I'm not suggesting you have to spoon the dirt in your mouth, but like, you know, if you drop the little cherry tomato, just pick it up, blow it off, stick it in your mouth. Don't go wash, don't go wash off the good guys that are coming with it. Tammy, um, um, we yeah. have a question about um, how do you know if your microbiome is out of whack? Right. And so there's lots of different ways to talk about that. But really quick before we go there, Jennifer, did I get both your questions? Oh, thank you, Dr. G. No, the second one was um, you touched briefly on the hormones. Is that is there like a test or something you can do like before I go into menopause so I know like what else I can fix on top of what you've already fixed for me? <laughs> Understand. Um, so it really kind of depends. What I generally, you know, you and I have been working together on stuff, and so we could totally run some of those tests. And we actually created a panel at Ulta Labs, Gloria and I did, that's actually designed to hit the main hormones that might be out of whack. It might be contributing things like a DHEA level is something that often people have never had done. Um, and so there is a basic, you can even order it yourself sort of lab, although if we order it directly for you, you actually get a discount. But, um, but anyway, so there are some basic labs that people can order a full thyroid panel and not just that TSH, which your regular doctor orders, but like a full thyroid panel. And also, again, some of those female hormones, if you're still if you're pre-menopause, you know, an estrogen and progesterone ratio, um, a DHEA level is a good idea. If you are male, then obviously having a total and free testosterone, right? Those kinds of things can be very helpful to see if there's an imbalance. I still generally tell people that before you would get those labs done, if you haven't already worked on your microbiome and figured out if these other factors are at play for you, you know, if it turns out you have a huge adrenal problem, I would not fix your female hormones. I would fix your adrenals because usually fixing your adrenals will then fix your female hormones. And so less medication is always more fun. Right. All right. Thank um, you. You're so welcome. All right. The question of how do you know if your microbiome has issues? And so, you know, the microbiome is a big player in how much gas people have. So if you feel like you get bloated frequently, if you feel like you have a lot of gas, or if you feel like you burp a lot, if you feel like there are foods that don't sit as well, you know, if your best tummy is when you first wake up in the morning and pretty much everything after that goes downhill, that's a really good sign that you have a microbiome problem. Um, there are stool changes that people will see. Um, and again, for some people, it isn't even their gut symptoms, it's their moods, it's their other things. So risk factors, like, have you had a lot of those stressors and antibiotics? And do you eat a conventional diet most of the time where you're eating things that are just chock full of microbiome disrupting chemicals? Um, and so there's, there's a whole questionnaire. One of the things that we created, right? Because this is what happens when you see a functional medicine doctor, right? You sit down with, with the doctor for anywhere from 60 to, you know, 120 minutes and you go through everything that's ever happened in your life and you look for patterns. And so I took some time and I tried to distill out for each of these different things. Like what are the signs that you would have a problem with a microbiome issue? Or what are the signs that you have a problem with food sensitivities? Or what are the signs that you have a problem with insulin resistance? And so I tried to kind of create that functional medicine visit experience focused on weight loss type triggers um, in a box, right? So that this is what you, what you would be able to walk yourself through is that, uh, we have this program and it contains a quiz for each of those six categories that you sit down and you go through point by point by point by point by point and you score and you see at the end of it like wow 
I have, you'll probably have at least a couple things in every category because whatever, you live in America. Um, and so this is, this is what life in modern America is, you know, even I've been working on this for a very long time in my own health and I still have a couple points in most categories because it's almost impossible, you can't live in a bubble. However, what you should notice is like, oh, wow, I have a lot of points under microbiome and a lot of points under insulin resistance. And so that would tell you if I want to work on my weight loss, I should do the things that support a healthy microbiome and lower my insulin levels, right? And so I maybe don't have to worry about the toxic thing as much, right? Or I maybe don't have to worry about the thyroid hormone testing as much because I don't have as many of those kinds of symptoms. And that's that's what we were trying to create, right? Because it is really complex and it's really personalized. The other thing that I found very frustrating in my standard family practice was that, you know, Western medicine has really gone to a randomized control trial type practice style. So it wants everybody to be like everybody else. So if you have asthma, I'm supposed to just go down the checklist and say, oh, you have symptoms two times a week, so you get this inhaler. Oh, you have symptoms six times a week, so you get this inhaler and this inhaler. Congrats, have a nice day. When you come back, if your symptoms are lower, I pat myself on the back and say, I did a good job, right? It doesn't say, oh, wait a minute, why do you have asthma? You have asthma because you live in a house where everybody smokes. And so what we really need to do is we need to get your parents to stop smoking <laughs> because if they weren't smoking in the house, then you wouldn't have asthma. And so you wouldn't need to take a steroid inhaler that might stunt your growth at the age of 11, right? Or, wow, you are a competitive swimmer and you are in so much chlorine. And it turns out that you actually have a chlorine sensitivity and that chlorine toxicity is actually causing you to have asthma. And so you don't need inhalers, you need to switch to a different pool that uses bromine so that you are not actually feeling under attack every time you go swimming, right? I'm not telling you you can't continue to swim, but I am telling you we have to support your detox. And so then you don't need, you don't need those $200 a month inhalers. What you need is to fix the reason you have asthma or most commonly, right? You have food sensitivities to dairy. And so you need to stop eating dairy and then your immune system will stop being on the rampage and your eczema and your allergies and your asthma will sort of melt away. And so, you know, that approach solves the problem instead of just saying, oh, okay, I have this checklist based on 10,000 people, even if you don't resemble most of those 10,000 people, right? Okay. I want to talk a little bit. We, we have some questions about food. Okay. Uh, kombucha. And then what do you think about legumes and what are healthy carbs? We'll throw all those together. Okay. So I'm going to start with kombucha. Kombucha is a fermented drink for people who like the taste of vinegar. Kombucha is sometimes um, appealing to them. It is kind of a vinegary or sour tasting um, beverage. And it's a great way to drink your ferments right? Some of them have a lot of sugar. <laughs> so I would say just be careful. Um, Walmart actually carries a pretty decent brand. I'm blanking, but I want to say it's called GTs. Um, but anyway, there is, there is a good brand available inexpensively at Walmart that actually is relatively low in sugar and pretty clean that I often recommend to people if they like kombucha. Um, but it's another fermented drink. And if you like it, go to town, have fun, drink one or two a day. It's a great way to get your good guys. Um, somebody, you said healthy carbs and legumes. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that I dislike about American culture is that we are a fad based culture and we, um, we like easy, quick answers to everything. <laughs> and so as a result, uh, somebody will come out with a new book and then everybody wants to follow that diet and it's not personalized. Right. And so everybody's microbiome is a little bit unique everybody's life experiences are unique and everybody's genetics are a little bit unique. And all of those factors play together to determine which foods are best for you, right? So I had a bunch of concussions when I was in um, sports in high school. And so I damaged my brain and gut lining when I had those concussions and I developed a bunch of food sensitivities to the things I was eating at the time, which included lots of animal products. And so for me, animal products are really one of the biggest bad guys out there. And so I eat a lot of beans and lentils and plant-based proteins and those feel good to me. 
other people might discover that those legumes are harder to digest for them. And so they make them feel bloated or gassy and uncomfortable, and they don't tolerate them well, and they feel better on a more paleo style diet, right? Where they eat clean animal proteins and they avoid the harder to digest grains and, and legumes. Both grains and legumes have a huge long shelf life because they are full of some natural anti-digestion chemicals that mother nature puts in there so that they can fall off the plant in October and lay dormant in the soil during the winter until it gets warm and wet in the spring. And then they sprout and then they grow, right? Because if they try to grow in December in Ohio, <laughs> they're gonna die. And so those natural anti-digestion chemicals like phytic acid, which you may have heard about in the news at some point, they also make it harder for you to digest them. And so uh, one of the things I do, since I eat so many legumes all the time, is I sprout most of my legumes before I eat them. I actually tell them it's spring <laughs> and dissolve all that phytic acid and remove it so that then I can go ahead and eat them without some of the tummy distress that many people have. But you have to talk to your body. You have to try some of these things. You have to personalize. Everybody's microbiome and everybody's body is unique. And so you have to have the tools to understand what your body is saying when you try them and the tools to maybe try them in a better way to decide whether or not legumes are good for you and whether or not they're good for you right now because your microbiome is dynamic. And so you might have something growing in there right now that doesn't tolerate lentils, but if you work on your microbiome and you fix it, then six months from now, lentils might be fine. And so again, one of the things that's really different about, I think what Gloria and I do is like, I'm not here to tell you, okay, here's 21 days of food ideas, eat these things. All of you are gonna have exactly the same response and it's gonna go fantastic. Just do exactly what I say. I'm here to say, your body is a dynamic, complex ecosystem. And I want you to communicate with it and understand, but I'm gonna give you lots of references and ideas and guidance so that you know how to have that conversation and you know what the conversation means so that you can design the perfect you diet and the perfect you lifestyle because that's what will actually work, right? Long-term and it will, will allow you to adapt long-term. Um, healthy carbs. <laughs> we all need, we all need carbs, right? And if you eat no carbs, like on a ketogenic diet or like Atkins diet, which is super unclean for most people, but um, we all need carbs. Your brain especially only runs on two fuels. It runs on sugar. It's the only organ in your body that doesn't need insulin to take up sugar. Um, and it consumes about 600 calories of sugar a day for most people. So we all need carbs. We can get carbs from carbs, or we can get carbs from protein by cutting off the nitrogen and creating our own carbs um, from the liver. And so um, we have to have carbs, but we are a carb loving society. <laughs> and most of human history, we did not eat refined carbs ever, right? Like maybe you would find some honey in a tree, but other than that, you were not running around in nature finding random natural sweeteners sitting around, right? There was no, no cane sugar <laughs> and no, no high fructose corn syrup sitting around, right? Um, and grains would have required a lot of work, right? Grains require farming. There aren't very many natural grains. Fruits are full of sugar. And so fruits are something humans have eaten forever. And that's always been a healthy piece of most people's diets. Um, but if you have insulin resistance, right? Then carbs are a double-edged sword. And so sometimes if you eat too much carb, then people can actually spike that insulin even further and cause a whole cascade of additional issues. If your microbiome is disordered, many carbs also feed the wrong um, bacteria and sometimes fungus. And so people who have, again, things they don't want growing in their gut can also feel sort of sick when they have a bunch of sugar or carbs. And so healthy carbs are generally whole food carbs, unprocessed carbs things like whole grains or legumes or fruits or starchy vegetables. And most people can tolerate those, but might need to limit the quantity of them at the beginning if they have some of those issues I just mentioned. 
unhealthy carbs are things like potato chips and <laughs> refined pasta and tons of added sugar. Um, and so those things are almost always inflammatory to everybody. And so really being mindful of eating whole foods, no matter what types of foods are your preferred foods, eating them in their whole original form is a great starting point. Somebody said something about apple cider vinegar. I saw it go by also. Yep. Apple cider vinegar is a borderline ferment, in my opinion, kind of like yogurt. Yogurt has a little bit of bacteria, but not enough to be super helpful, just FYI. Um, it also has dairy, which many people don't tolerate, but even non-dairy yogurt doesn't really count as a huge amount of ferment. Apple cider vinegar is slightly fermented and has lots of health value and supports gut health and digestion, but it probably wouldn't count as your only fermented food. All right, <laughs> how, how am I doing? How do you recommend that we support our adrenals? Yeah. So I have a whole mantra thing called love your inner two-year-old. <laughs> Anyone who's ever taken care of a two-year-old and watched them melt down, that's adrenal, right? That is exactly what's happening is they are being flooded with adrenaline and cortisol and they are flipping out because they do not know how to handle how uncomfortable that all feels. And so all the things that would trigger a two-year-old are basically the things that you would want to be mindful of. So we all do better on a routine. We all do better not missing meals. We all do better getting outside and playing and moving. And we all do better if we don't say mean things to ourselves or we don't have other people saying mean things to us, right? You would never say to a two-year-old things that I bet you say to yourself every day, right? And so we, we do not love ourselves the way we love our two-year-olds. And so, you know, if I just had a quick second of how do you fix your adrenals is you love your inner two-year-olds. There are three exceptions to that. Two-year-olds aren't allowed to drive, use sharp objects like knives, <laughs> um, or have sex. And so as long as it's consensual, you as an adult get to do all those things. Those aren't adrenally harmful, right? But everything else, if you wouldn't do it to a two-year-old, I might challenge you <laughs> to not do it to yourself, right? Um, most women who've taken care of children ever do actually know how to do this. We just don't do it to ourselves. Um, yes, somebody said they had a toddler. <laughs> yes. And be sympathetic when your toddler is melting down, right? Recognize that that it is uncomfortable, right? It is uncomfortable. And so trying to help them get out of that fight or flight is always the answer. And do that to yourself when you are feeling really stressed or strained, when you notice you're getting hangry, you know, because two-year-olds are the only honest ones. The rest of us are still feeling that crappy. We're just taught we're not allowed to express it anymore, which is a big problem. All right. <laughs> well, we, we don't, you can continue to put messages in there. One yeah. of the things I want to say is if you wish that you could just talk to Dr. G all day, <laughs> um, then you might be interested in the course that we're um, that we're going to be offering you. Um, what we did was sat down and decided to figure out how to convey all the information about all of those six areas to someone through videos, through lessons, through handouts, which we've organized in a really beautiful way. And um, I've done some videos on toxins and dealing with that and exercise, which is something we haven't mentioned. And um, it's really nice because the way it starts out is the way Dr. G was saying earlier, is that you're going to take a, um, a survey, a quiz within the course and answer a bunch of questions that once you're done will help guide you to, I don't want to use the word diagnose, but kind of figure out. Understand, which, right? Understand is a good way yeah. of saying it. Understand which areas are most relevant to your journey with your weight and your health. I mean, anything that affects your weight is going to affect your health. It's all this ecosystem that we talked about. And it's hard to figure things out. I mean, there's a whole section in there about detox. We talked about toxins. Toxins hold on to fat and fat holds on to toxins. So you've got to figure out a way to get out of that cycle. There's information in there about the adrenals, but you can focus on what resonates most with you. Right. And it's designed 
Like we wanted, one other thing I've learned is that almost nobody has made it through <laughs> the last couple of years without feeling just a little bit overextended and tapped out. And so the way I used to do this, I think I was throwing too many things at people all at once, right? I have a tendency to just get so excited about fixing things that then I just throw everything, including the kitchen sink at you and people are like, whoa. Um, and so one other thing I really like about what we redesigned in this program is actually to make it based on more like a tiny habits model, right? Like to make small incremental changes that feel doable so that you are in charge. Because again, so many diet programs and weight loss programs out there are really like, oh, I'm going to help you lose those 15 pounds. And it's great. And you lose those 15 pounds for like three months <laughs> and then you gain 17 pounds back. And you end up being slightly heavier than you were to start with because you didn't actually change the reason that you had the weight in the first place. You just temporarily pushed down. And like a cork, when you push down, the harder you push down, the harder it pushes back. And eventually it's going to break up. And so I don't want that, right? I don't want you to lose 10 pounds for the summer, right? I want you to move to a healthy weight for the rest of your life. I want you to handle everything that comes at you with the skills to say, oh, well, what's happening now? Oh, it looks like that tummy infection I had, that COVID I had just ripped up my microbiome. And now I'm putting on weight. I need to fix my microbiome. That's what I need to do, right? And so even if that's not your issue right now, these tools help you take your current challenges and solve them, but also help you handle whatever challenges are coming because your body's anti-starvation mechanism, that doesn't change. That's been there since we were human. And so these principles are not, you know, a six week phenomenon. These principles are a lifelong guiding post. And so that's what I want, right? Again, I don't wanna, I, not that I don't want you to look lovely in a bikini this summer. <laughs> I do. <laughs> That's important to you. But what I really want is for you to unlock the successful key to being well, right? Like that's what I really want. And so, so anyway, so it's designed to give you those things and we start with helping you figure out what's happening. And then we build on little incremental tools and suggestions. Here are six things you could change in your diet to fix insulin resistance. And you pick which one you want to do. And there's supports and recipes and things and links to where you can find more resources and all the kinds of things that would happen if you saw a functional medicine doctor and they personalized a plan for you, but you get to do the personalization and you get to spread it out over six weeks if you want, or over 12 weeks, or if life is really crazy and you get started on the diet, but you can't take on the exercise for a little while, then you don't, you take it on when you're ready. And so it's designed to break it into manageable chunks for people if, if you feel like you need help, right? I mean, if you feel like you're leaving today's talk and you're just like, oh, I 100% know exactly what I'm going to go do now. Hallelujah. Great. I hope that you run with this and just succeed beyond your wildest dreams. But if you feel like you need some help and you can't necessarily take on a whole bunch of doctor visits, um, or there's just not room in my schedule for you, um, then <laughs> you can try this online and you can, and you can do it at your own pace over time. Um, and the cool thing about our programs is assuming that we are still alive and kicking, um, they are still alive and kicking, right? For as long as we continue to have programs, they're lifetime access. And so uh, that's another really cool piece about what we're doing. Because again, sometimes we need refreshers, right? Sometimes we make life changes and then other things happen and then we need reminders, right? Or we need to go back or we maybe didn't need the microbiome unit right now, but we do after Christmas. And so, you know, the idea is that this, these are tools for forever for you, okay? One of the things too that's included in the course is a community. It's kind of like a private Facebook page without being on Facebook. You're just with our group, you can ask questions and I will be monitoring the community as well. So it's not like you're on your own. You can ask questions through the community. Other people may jump in and want to have a discussion about what did you do that worked? Or I tried this. Did you like that recipe? Or yeah, I love this recipe. I want you to try it. Um, all of those things are in there. And also we've been sending out, Dr. G has been great about this weekly 
recipes to try because sometimes you know, you want to do it, but you just don't have the tools. You don't know what should I do. And actually, um, one of the things we're going to be doing, and I can share my screen in a minute and show you how you can sign up. But one of the things we're also doing is providing you with a lot of resources, shopping lists, um, grocery, um, you know, comp like the recipes, um, ways to figure out if you're eating a rainbow. That's a big thing for Dr. G is making sure you eat a rainbow of colorful food every day. Um, and so we give you a lot of resources as well, but the community is really nice. And then um, you alluded to this earlier, once you've done the course, if you're still like, wow, I really just cannot get a handle on this. We did yeah. put together a panel of lab tests and there's an option to go further once you're done to say, I, I really need more help. I need to identify what's going on with me. And so there is a panel of lab tests that we negotiated an amazing rate with a lab company to yes, put it all it together for you. I mean, we can't yeah. even believe what they get, yeah. but it's great. So And you would get, if you need to do that and you feel like your regular doctor isn't able to help you interpret that, you know, the idea is that you could tell us we can order it for you. And then you would have like a half hour discussion um, to talk about what those results mean, right? If you if you feel like you need that. And so um, which without a commitment of necessarily needing to sign into the whole functional medicine evaluation bandwagon, but just to kind of make sure that you're interpreting that medical information with guidance, right? Because again, we're not trying to leave anybody hanging. We wanna, we wanna allow people, but many people can solve it without the blood work, right? I mean, I really will tell you, learning to communicate with your body is amazingly powerful and your body will tell you lots and lots and lots of good things. Yeah. Gloria is showing you our website here and how, if you feel like you need us, um, how you could, how you could find us. Right. And so um, this is just at getwellwithus.net. Um, yes, not yeah. com, not dot com. Please remember it is getwellwithus.net. There's a really weird site at getwellwithus.com. <laughs> That's oh, so true. And um, here's the course right here. For everybody that's listening today, we do have a, until next Friday, the course opens up next Friday on July 15th. Until then, there's a code, wait 100 July. 22. Wait 100 July 22. Oh, 20. It's going to come in your, it's going to come in your email, right. but that gives you a hundred dollars off. So if people sign up with that code before next Friday, and that couldn't be could be people that aren't even here. Like if you have, if you know someone that you think might want to do this, um, they can use that code until next Friday, through next Friday. Um, and it gets you a hundred dollars off. And didn't we also put a special code? If you want to do this with a friend, we highly, highly recommend having yeah. a buddy to do this with. And that way you can schedule some time where you guys can chat about what you learned. It's the best yeah. way to learn. And yeah. So, and if you email Gloria at getwellwithus.com, Gmail, Gmail get well with us at gmail.com. It's like, that doesn't make sense. Um, then you, and you tell her then what, she, what she'll do is she'll sign you up because we can give you a second discount code on top of it. It only lets you put in one coupon, but we also have a buddy code. So if you are signing up together with someone, then you both get an extra 50 bucks off. Right, which is great. And like I said, doing it with the buddy is the best way. We'll be your buddy through the community. Hopefully you'll make some friends through there. And there's such great information in here. It's more than just weight loss. This is more about you. Health. How do you take care of you so that as you go through life, because one thing that people forget sometimes is that health is cumulative. You don't just have a heart attack. You don't just put on weight. Those things happen over time. And so we want you to change your life. This isn't just about losing a few pounds. That's why it's so different than what you've seen before. This is learning about taking care of yourself and it will manifest in other ways than weight loss. It'll help you with your energy, feeling good, not having that afternoon slump, being able to sleep better, all of those things play a role 
in your full body health, in your holistic health. And that's really what we want to see for you and for everybody that we care about and love. Yeah. And I will also tell you, I mentioned, right, that I had my cancer journey and had to change my diet. And my doctors didn't tell me how to do that. I mean, I just had to figure it out. And then years later, I even had a stricter diet when I gave birth to a baby that had like more food sensitivities than anything. I mean, we could eat poultry and vegetables and a couple fruits. That was it. We couldn't have nuts. We couldn't have legumes. We couldn't have any other animal products of any kind. We couldn't have most grains. We couldn't have anything. <laughs> and the doctor was just like, oh, cut all these foods out of your diet. Have a nice day. I'll see you in three months. And I went into the grocery store and I was like, ah, what am I supposed to eat? I'm breastfeeding this child and I'm starving. I'm so hungry and I can't eat anything that I would normally eat. I can't have almonds. I can't have raspberries. I can't have any of these foods that I'm so familiar with. And I was just given this list of no, right? And you can't eat no, you have to eat yes. And so I vowed to myself that I would A, figure it out and raise this healthy, beautiful baby, which I did. She's seven now and she can eat almost all of those things back. We got almost all of that healed up for her and she is fantastic. Um, but I will also tell you that I've created yes lists, right? Like I don't frame this. I don't ever want anybody to feel like I did because I had a medical degree and a personal experience of huge amounts of diet research and restricted diet experience under my belt before I even started and I still felt overwhelmed. And so I don't want that to be your experience, right? If you have to make changes, if you are trying to figure out, if you have food sensitivities, if you're trying to figure out how to heal something in your body, I don't want you to feel like you have to suddenly reinvent medical school and spend your whole life on the internet trying to solve it. I want you to have tools, right? To support you. Because if someone had handed me a yes list, that would have been way easier. <laughs> One of the things that um, we have a question about is how long the course is for. It's as uh, long yeah. as it takes you. Yeah, it's um, designed to be about six to eight weeks though, right? Like it's designed, if you take about a week per section, like each section is cumulative. So you you learn what you need to learn. And then you kind of take little quizzes to make sure you understand it. Um, we're not grading you or anything. It's just personal feedback, but you finish those tasks and then it opens up the next section to help you walk through and in a productive, organized way, right? Um, and so if you do about one a week, which is the kind of idea behind the structure, then it would take you six to eight weeks to get through the whole process. For some people, maybe you already have an excellent exercise routine. So like you might be able to go through the exercise part of it much faster. And so then you could shorten that. Or maybe you feel like exercise is the bane of your existence and you wanna work on that part for three weeks to find what really fits for you, then that's fine. But the, the idea is that you could get through the course in about six to eight weeks um, in a not feeling overwhelmed kind of way right? In a, in a steady, you know, 15, 20 minutes of effort a day kind of, kind of way. Um, but, but it's yours forever. So, you know, you could do it every six months. If you need a refresher, you could do it. And it's all just yours. You just own it at that point. Yep. Well, I, if there's no other questions, we're running out of time, but we could talk to you all day. We love this. <laughs> this is our passion, helping people. And really the whole concept here was to create something that was affordable, that you could learn from and make good lifestyle change so that as you age, you feel great and that you go through life feeling as good as you could possibly feel without the need for drugs and surgery and all the things that people seem to get exposed to when really it's not necessary. It really isn't. This is all about you. Right. Nobody was born with a Lipitor deficiency. <laughs> or, or a gluten deficiency or any of those other things. So, all right. Any other questions? Okay. Well, you will get an email from us. Anyone that registered and wasn't able to attend will get an email as well with a link with the code. And feel free to reach out if you have other questions. You can always reach out to me, Gloria, at um, getwellwithus at gmail. Pretty simple. All right. Thank you all for joining us today. We so appreciate you taking time out of your busy weekend. We love you. We 
here for you. And right. yep, sounds really good. <laughs> um, what was that email again for Gloria? Get well get here. Get well <clears throat> with us at gmail.com. And I, I think go ahead. I was gonna say, go ahead. Oh no, I was gonna say I forgot to say at the beginning that I'm a board certified holistic health practitioner and coach. And I support Dr. G's patients and help them. If you have questions, send them to me. If they're above my pay grade, I'll make sure they get to Tammy. <laughs> <laughs> and you will get this information in an email with the link to this session. Um, and so you don't have to have remembered all of this administrative stuff. It's all going to come to your inbox the way the link to the session came for the Zoom link. Okay. So it's all just going to be there this afternoon once we get this uploaded. All righty. Thanks again for joining us. That's right. Be All well. Right. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you.